All right, we'll get it started. The first talk of the session is going to be given by Felix from Te Technical University of Munich. And we'll, we'll just go ahead. All right, thanks. OK, hello, everyone. So um, this survey ended up on my Twitter quite recently. And it nicely describes the problem I want to address in this talk. So it says, I'm a programmer looking for a solution on Stack Overflow to paste into my project. So as you can see, it received a lot of love from the community, lots of likes and lots of retreats. And indeed, Stack Overflow is the most popular question and answer website for programmers. It relies on community moderation to bubble up the best answer and weed out unhelpful advice to any programming question. So most of the time, answers come as a code snippet. And that makes it incredibly easy to just copy that code straight into your software and think no more of it. Apparently, as the survey indicates, this is common behavior and part of uh, most developers' workflows now nowadays. So as this speaks for um, the high usability and utility of Stack Overflow, it unfortunately comes with a major risk for application security. So and that's uh, when it comes to security-related questions and usability issues around cryptographic APIs. So this Stack Overflow question, for example, uh, shows one of the biggest issues in Android. How can you accept a certificate uh, during TLS handshake that is not part of the default Android Trust Store? So this question showed, showed up quite a lot, and we observed that millions of developers have looked it up. So it seems that it's a super important use case for Android developers, but the crypto API just didn't support it. And popular answers on Stack Overflow for this question were unsafe workarounds, uh, where the crypto API was simply overridden. They contained this null verifier here, uh, or some kind of variation of it, uh, that renders the TLS handshake vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. So here, certificate verification is simply turned off. However, it technically solved the initial problem as it now accepts any certificate. And developers seem to be super happy with it. They got rid of their pesky certificate error. And that's probably why they happily upvoted those answers until they became the most popular and accepted answer on Stack Overflow. So in our Oakland paper in 2017, we've shown that those kind of code snippets that were insecure due to crypto misuse uh, were indeed reused in almost 200,000 Android applications uh, available on Google Play. And those included high-profile apps with an install base of over 5 billion users, and apps from security-sensitive categories like business, finance, and health, and social media. Another paper from our, one of our co-authors uh, demonstrated how to attack apps um, and steal credentials, credit card numbers, and other private data based on these insecure code snippets from Stack Overflow. In our ICSE paper last year, we've shown that, this, that Stack Overflow's content indicators, uh, such as the community given score uh, and the view counts for, of given answers, uh, all point towards the wrong direction security-wise, and therefore inadvertently promoted crypto misuse. So usability issues um, with crypto APIs lead to vulnerable code, which additionally gets promoted and distributed by an Alexa Top 50 website almost all developers use to get help. So this, to tackle this huge problem, um, different forms of security advice have been improved, tested, and compared with Stack Overflow. For instance, books and formal documentation, static code analysis tools, and simplified cryptographic APIs that were specifically designed um, keeping usability in mind. So even though all of these approaches um, helped in improving code security, developers really struggled with getting running code out of it. They were less productive under given time constraints than developers that were allowed to use Stack Overflow. A very surprising and disappointing example were the simplified cryptographic APIs, as they performed the worst in terms of productivity. Some developers uh, even had to look up the source code of the API to figure out what it actually does. 
And that's the complete opposite uh, you want to achieve with an interface. They were oversimplified and therefore only supported a very small range of use cases. So the most important thing for us to learn from these studies was that whenever developers encountered a usability issue with one of these approaches, they turned to the web and went for code shopping on Stack Overflow once again. So they went back to their default behavior. So and that goes in line with a famous quote of Richard Thaler, the founder of the nudge theory, which is a concept from behavioral science and economics. So and it says, first, never underestimate the power of inertia. So again, as we've seen, when, uh, whenever developers encounter usability issues with crypto APIs, they ask Stack Overflow for help. So when the quote continues with, second, that power can be harnessed. So don't even try to change the default behavior as it's too powerful, but rather try to harness it in a way that it improves the outcome. So and that inspired us uh, for, for our main idea. So let's try to harness code shopping on Stack Overflow to help uh, developers get cryptography right. Okay, but well, how to do that? So one of our most important findings to answer this question was that on Stack Overflow, uh, similar and secure code examples are available for almost all of the insecure code snippets. So for any insecure code example, there's a pretty high chance to get an alternative code example that practically does the same thing but in a secure way. So in the end, we see getting cryptography right as a decision-making problem. And that's where the nudge theory comes into play. So the basic idea is uh, to nudge people towards better decisions without restricting their options or requiring them to change their incentives. So you rather change the choice architecture to steer people into a particular direction. Here on the, uh, in the example on the right, people have two options for getting upstairs. However, using the stairs is the better option in terms of health but people prefer to use the escalator. But with the new choice architecture where the stairs now look like a piano keyboard that makes sounds when you walk upstairs, people tend to favor this option. So and that's the, the key aspect of the nudge theory. It does not try to restrict or require to change incentives. It re redesigns the choice architecture in a way that identified behavior leads to better outcomes. So our goal was to design a new choice architecture on Stack Overflow, and it nudges people towards reusing code examples that provide secure and strong cryptography. And it must not interfere with the usability and the utility of Stack Overflow, such that developers can keep their high productivity level using the website and are not drawn away from it. So but to be able to do that, we first had to find these better alternatives on Stack Overflow. So we had to solve three technical problems. We needed to be able to predict the similarity of crypto API usage patterns, their use cases, and their security, of course. So we combined supervised and unsupervised deep learning to learn these things directly from code available on Stack Overflow. So in the first step, we learned how to predict the similarity of crypto API usage patterns. Thereby, we had to consider a problem that's very specific to Stack Overflow and where deep learning helped. So code examples uh, on Stack Overflow are oftentimes incomplete and erroneous programs. That means their representation, the code graphs used to determine similarity uh, may be unsound. So you may end up with different code graphs for the same pattern. Uh, for instance, uh, if one comes from a complete program and the other one does not. Deep learning, however, doesn't really mind. It learns its own representation that's optimized uh, for the problem it tries to solve. So the network tries its best to determine those features that allow it to predict similarity even though inputs are unsound. So as a first step, uh, we learned a new representation for crypto API usage patterns. And we did that by embedding their code graphs into a vector space using structure to vec So in these embeddings are learned su such that uh, similar patterns are uh, closer together and dissimilar patterns are more far away each, uh, from each other in the embedding space. So this way, we can simply use a distance function to determine whether patterns are similar or not. So this is the architecture of our embedding network. It's a Siamese architecture that uses two networks to generate embeddings, either for two similar or dissimilar patterns. So during training, we calculate the distance of both embeddings generated by the network. 
And if they are too close or too far away from each other, uh, we backpropagate the loss to update and improve the network in generating new embeddings. So in the second step, uh, we wanted to predict, um, to learn how to predict the use case of a pattern. For instance, initializing a cipher or verifying a certificate. So since we already trained uh, a model for pattern similarity, we considered very beneficial knowledge for predicting use cases. We transferred this knowledge from the similarity domain into the use case domain by applying transfer learning. And in the last step, uh, last and most important step, uh, we trained the security model. And it predicts whether your cipher initialization or certificate verification is secure or not. And here we basically did the same thing again. We applied transfer learning to reuse the similarity information encoded in the embeddings to train a new model for predicting security. So what we did was we just added another hidden layer highlighted in red on top of the embedding network highlighted in blue. So with the blue layer, uh, while the blue layer already encodes the similarity information, the red layer will learn the use case or the security information of patterns. And based on that information, the classification layer on the right will then be able to predict what use case it is and whether it's insecure or not. So we applied different techniques to train the classification network. With one technique called transfer learning, we input the pattern graph into the fixed pre-trained embedding network. Then we only update the weights of the use case or security layer based on the classification loss. With another technique called warm starting, we also updated the weights of the pre-trained embedding network based on the classification loss. So this way, we update the pattern embedding as well in a way that it helps deciding whether a pattern is insecure or not. OK, so since code similarity does not necessarily need to be not learned from a code that applies uh, crypto, we were able to comp compile an arbitrarily large data set. So for instance, theoretically, all public Java repositories on, on GitHub. However, the data set with the crypto code snippets we obtained from Stack Overflow was relatively small. So in warm starting and transfer learning helped us in, in tackling this challenge. Transferring knowledge we obtained from large data sets helped us in learning from small data sets more effectively. So here on the left side, you can now see the results of the similarity model. So it shows all crypto API patterns we extracted from Stack Overflow highlighted by the use case. So each point relates to a pattern. So for, for several use cases, you can already see that the similarity model creates dense clusters. For instance, um, the Cypher cluster in blue or the TLS cluster in orange. But it creates sparse clusters for some of the other use cases, for instance, for key generation or IVs. As you can see on the right, um, the use case model is able to correct this. It moves patterns closer together that belong to the same use case, uh, but that are not necessarily very similar. Here in the middle of uh, this slide, you can see uh, the results of the similarity model again. Uh, so the distance uh, still represents similarity, um, but the color now indicates uh, security. So red is insecure and blue is secure. So in this uh, cipher cluster down here, it nicely indicates that our main idea of nudging people away from insecure to secure uh, is actually technically feasible. So the cipher cluster here has a security boundary. That means that patterns that are close uh, to this boundary actually provide very useful alternatives. They do the same thing, but one is secure and the other one is not. So in this shows a cherry-picked example of it. So on the left side, uh, you see a warning for an insecure pattern as we show it on Stack Overflow. At the bottom, you can see the list of recommendations, which is ordered by similarity and use cases. When you click on the first link, uh, you will end up on, a, on the secure Stack Overflow post shown on the right. And as you can see, it is basically the same code. Uh, it only differs in the statement that rendered the whole code snippet insecure before. However, developers might ignore basically everything I just showed and copy the insecure code anyway. Whenever we detect an insecure copy attempt on Stack Overflow, we trigger a reminder notch. And that shows the warning and recommendations again in order to make the user pay attention. All right, so now that we have 
had everything together, uh, we wanted to test our system design within a developer study. And we had two treatments, the nudge and the control group, and both had to solve two programming tasks, uh, symmetric encryption and certificate verification. We had two metrics, functional correctness, which uh, allowed us to measure the productivity of developers, and security, of course, which told us whether a, secure, a solution was secure or not. So uh, once again, functional correctness was very important for us, um, as our nudges must not interfere with a great user experience of Stack Overflow. So developers should be uh, able to happily uh, continue to copy and paste stuff uh, and stay as productive as they have been with original Stack Overflow. And yes, our nudges uh, did not have a significant effect on functional correctness. So both treatments, nudged and control, uh, achieved a very high level of functional correct solutions uh, within the given time constraints. That means it doesn't matter whether you were notched or not, Stack Overflow remains, remains a very effective and uh, efficient in solving programming tasks. So if we now uh, get secure solutions on top, we exactly achieved uh, what the nudge theory had promised us. And indeed, the nudge treatment achieved significantly more secure solutions than the control. And interestingly, being a professional or security knowledge didn't have any effect on security. So solely the nudges made a difference here. So to wrap up the talk, I'd like to show one of the most surprising results of our studies. And that was that it helped tackling null verifiers quite well. So a short reminder, uh, we found out that 91% of apps uh, with code from Stack Overflow contained a null verifier. So certificate verification was basically turned off. Based on those code examples uh, from Stack Overflow, one of our co-authors was able to attack them. Only 0.2% of apps um, that reuse code from Stack Overflow um, got certificate verification right. And in another th study where participants were uh, only allowed to use simplified cryptographic APIs, uh, there none of them got it right. However, nudge participants achieved 77% secure solutions, while the control group was again quite behind with 67% uh, insecure solutions. So that's cool because uh, this was the problem with the highest risk for application security. And it was also the use case on Stack Overflow that had the fewest uh, secure code examples. We found over 1,000 examples of null verifiers and only 50 to 60 uh, examples that provided security best practices. However, if you implement the right choice architecture on Stack Overflow, those few examples seem to be already enough. All right, well, so what's next? Um, we recently applied for the academic partnership program with Stack Overflow, and that would allow us to further test and improve our approach within a larger field study uh, with real Stack Overflow and real Stack Overflow users. Um, of course, we'd be happy to test our approach with any company or institution, um, so feel free to contact us. So we'd love to see Stack Overflow considering some of our ideas. Since almost all developers use this website, we should make sure that they stay on a safe path. We believe that it could have a huge positive effect on how cryptography is used in the real world. All right, thank you very much, and I'm now I'm happy to take questions. Hi, uh, do you have any plans on trying to integrate this into text editors? Um, so currently not, but sure, why not? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, given that we have some time, could you go into a little more detail about how these nudges actually appear on the Stack Overflow page? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, okay, so here, um, so this is one of the nudges. So here we have the security warning. Um, so the text and the icons is basically inspired by the uh, text and icons used um, in Chrome for security warnings. Um, so yeah, we show this warning. We show also uh, annotations uh, like below the statement that, um, is that, that causes the snippet to be insecure. Um, and yeah, below the warning, we have the recommendations. So that list um, displays different Stack Overflow posts, 
and it's ordered by the similarity of the code um, to the code snippet you see above in the warning. Um, so that's the, the first, um, the first um, metric we use to order it, and the second one is the use case. So if the similarity is not enough, mm -hmm. we, use the, um, we, we at least show something that applies the same use case. Okay. Um, yeah, and then you can just click on one of those, uh, and then we show positive security indicators, as shown on the right, mm -hmm. um, that indicate that we didn't find any, uh, uh, anything that causes a problem. And we had another nudge called the default nudge, where we um, basically reordered the search results on the web page. Mm -hmm. So if you search for something, um, we reordered the uh, results based on security, so that you, can, that you get the, um, the posts that are secure first. Right, hi. Um, how do you make sure that the results of your user study are not biased? I mean, you're working with developers who know how Stack Overflow looks like, how it operates. So if you introduce something new, why aren't they just following this new feature then? Um, so we, we didn't do any priming. Like, we tried not to mention security or something like that. And, and we also tested for systematic differences um, based on the demographics, and we didn't find any. All right, okay. So if I'm looking at this example, it, it seems like there's, it, it's this sort of the, this example seems very simple to find. You're looking for just allow all host name verify. Is this model able to capture more subtle bugs, or is it? Yeah, sure. Like, how does it compare to, say, a trivial, we're going to look for these certain indicators and flag them? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this, yeah, this is a very simple example, but uh, we are also able to uh, detect bugs like based on the, um, for instance, like uh, if initializing a key or initializing an IV or um, like, uh, yeah, or, or more sophisticated vulnerabilities. Um, this is just an example, and it shows a very simple um, case where you can, where you basically have to find, um, yeah, like this, this, this Java field that this Java field is somehow applied. Would this technique be also be useful for finding sec other security but non-cryptographical problems, such as uh, buffer overflow? Um, probably yes. <laughs> um, I mean, we so the, the the whole thing is based on on code graphs, um, and program dependency graphs, um, and we feed these graphs into the neural network. And there are other approaches that um, kind of use the same representation of code. Um, to actually find buffer overflows and so on. So yeah. All right. Well, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. So Shubo from Facebook is going to talk about crypto and frame. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be present on the behalf of the Krypton team. Um, Krypton is a very young framework. Um, it's essentially a machine learning framework based on um, secure MPC right now, but hopefully other techniques in the near future. Um, we open sourced um, last October, um, so giving us this opportunity to present um, means a lot to us. Um, I should also say that um, I'm not a cryptographer. This is only my second time at Real World Crypto, and that might reflect in some of the design decisions we have taken in, uh, in the framework itself. 
So a lot of the um, talk is going to be on how and why we design uh, Krypton the way it is. Um, every um, design has a set of trade-offs. Um, Krypton does too. Um, but hopefully um, a different set of trade-offs than what we have seen in uh, frameworks and libraries in this space, especially in the space of secure computing. Um, I'm going to use secure computing as a very broad term. I don't know if a formal definition exists. Um, but for me, it is um, a computing technique where you're computing on data that is uh, encrypted in some way. To kind of showcase uh, um, a 40,000 foot view of what these design decisions are, there is a, a piece of code on the right hand side which may be foreign to a lot of people here, but if you show this to somebody in the machine learning community, they're going to say, uh, oh, it looks just like PyTorch. Um, and PyTorch is a leading machine learning framework um, along with TensorFlow, which also looks fairly similar. Um, and that, in some sense, captures what we are trying to do um, with Krypton. Um, our, our primary goal is to expose the machine learning community to various secure computing techniques um, and the trade-offs that come with it. There are kind of, um, in my view, two broad aspects to this. Uh, the first aspect is that of the choice of models. Um, in the machine learning community now, for example, Let's take an example of computer vision, for example. Um, the models that are prevalent are deep residual networks. Um, they're actually not very convenient to work with um, in secure computing, uh, mainly because they have these nonlinearities that are hard to approximate. Uh, they're also deep in the sense there's a lot of multiplies and sequence that, that are problematic. Um, so making these trade-offs explicit to the community would hopefully help the community think in, in different ways, build models that are much friendlier, maybe shallower models. Uh, another concrete example is number encoding. Um, currently in machine learning, we use float32. There's a special 16-bit float type called BF16, neither of which are uh, very convenient to work with in, in cryptography or in, in secure computing, um, which likes to work with integers usually. Um, so this is another thing that we want to expose to the community as there, are, there is a space to think about different number encodings uh, when you're training models or doing inference with models. The other aspect is um, to expose the community to uh, a new feature, a feature that allows them to encrypt data and then do computing with data. And the hope is when you expose this feature, the community is going to think about more applications where uh, the data is sensitive and cannot be trained on in the clear. Um, I should at this point step back and say that Krypton is very much a research framework. Uh, nobody should take this framework and start training on data that actually needs to be um, secure. We are not at that point yet, but this is our first step. Uh, and the hope is like when these applications come to be, there are people from this room or from this community can help it um, build in the necessary security needed for the data that is at hand. So we look at um, this framework as very much a conversation starter between um, these two communities uh, because, let's face it, machine learning isn't go going away uh, and privacy is becoming, uh, and security are becoming more and more important. So with that in mind, let's look at what our main design goals are in Krypton. Um, so the first thing um, that first major design goal is we, we wanted to present a machine learning centric interface, uh, interface based around um, tensors and computation graphs, which I'm going to get a little bit uh, into more detail later on. That is um, how machine learning is done these days with neural networks. And the second one um, is explainable performance. By that I mean um, having a design that is very modular because modularity helps in uh, figuring out performance. It's easier to work with performance problems in a modular setup than when things are one monolithic uh, piece of code. So this is something we had in mind because if things are not fast, nobody's going to use it. The third one is um, debuggability. Krypton's a very young framework um, and the field is very new. So we wanted a, a mode where users who use this can figure out what has gone wrong. Um, so right now we only have a secure MPC setup, for example, so we have a mode where you can have 
multiple parties on one computer, for example, which helps you debug uh, when models are not uh, training. And I know that debuggability and security are kind of at odds with each other. With security, you are trying to hide stuff, while at debuggability, you are trying to reveal information. And I'm not really sure what the right design call here is. Um, and the last one is interoperability. And by that, I mean, um, you know, people have been doing machine learning for a while, so there are model formats, models that have people have trained, or um, they have trained mo or have models specified in other frameworks. We need to be able to import these models and continue training or do inference. Uh, so we have a compatibility layer, which is actually open source from Facebook, called Onyx, which is what we use to load models. So not only can we load models from PyTorch, we can load models from other uh, frameworks like TensorFlow, for example, which is from Google. Uh, all of these design goals um, leads to one uh, trade-off, which is a threat model. So we are in the, in the current version of Crypt and we are in the uh, honest but curious uh, mode. And I should also say that this is not something that is set in stone. Um, this is kind of the first setting on the dial. Um, and there's obviously gonna be trade-offs between things on the right and the things on the left. So we want to pursue other, um, address other threat models as well, but we wanna be very deliberate about what these trade-offs are. What do you gain from getting a better threat model and what do you lose from on the usability, um, usability side? We wanna make these trade-offs very, very explicit. Um, before I go into the details of Krypton, I wanted to give a brief um, kind of overview on what uh, machine learning frameworks look like, what their in ingredients are, of what we have seen in the last five years or so. So what makes an ML framework? So the first component um, of an ML framework is this object called a tensor, which is really a fancy name for a multidimensional uh, matrix, uh, usually of six dimensions and lower. Um, so anybody who has worked with MATLAB, this would be uh, very familiar. So it's uh, uh, in frameworks, the tensors are first class um, objects. Uh, the next thing you need is something that you need to, op that will do something with these tensors. So we have different operators that are basically functions um, that take tensors as input and tensors as, um, produce tensors as output. And these are chained together by a uh, directed acyclic graph, which is um, called a computation graph. You can think of these as uh, operators that are um, chained together. They, um, they take some tensors as input and produce inputs, uh, outputs that go to other um, operators. Um, and this computation graph is, has special structure, so it usually has um, one sync node, um, and then that sync node is used to um, propagate what is called gradient. So in, in machine learning, we are uh, trying to optimize a function, so we do a, a forward pass, uh, and then we do a backward pass uh, through this computation graph um, for, for the gradients. Um, I'm gonna show you a very, very simple um, computation graph because a picture is a thousand words and it'll help um, put some uh, diagram behind what I've talk, talked about. So I'm gonna start with um, these square boxes that are, that are tensors that go into um, a operator, which is a multiply in this case, uh, element-wise uh, multiply of two tensors, of two matrices. Um, that produces um, another, another tensor. So this is kind of what a forward graph is. Um, and to calculate the gradient, we, we kind of invert the graph. We kind of flip it around, but I'm gonna show it um, as a graph on the right-hand side. So for every operator on the left-hand side, you're gonna get a backward operator on the right-hand side. So for the mull, we have a bmull um, operator and the black arrows are the gradients flowing back. And then we have two special operators, accumulate gradient, which essentially uh, what they do is they accumulate gradients into the tensors from which the uh, input came from. Um, so every machine learning framework um, in existence has something uh, like this underneath it. Obviously the graphs get um, fairly complicated. Um, so let's see what among these um, components that we have seen exist in, in Krypton itself. We have tried to be uh, as much one is to one at, as possible. Um, so we have what is called a crypt tensor object, which is an encrypted tensor, which you can think of it as an abstract base class for people who are coming from the C++ world, um, which promises some functionality that these um, tensors will have. Um, it doesn't actually, it's kind of agnostic um, to what computing you're gonna use to ensure security um, at this point. But right now we have, we use, as I said, a secure multi-party compute. So there is a MPC tensor, 
uh, that sits underneath it. Uh, what we um, want to do going forward is um, our, our goal is to have um, other tensors at this level. So maybe we have a tensor that is backed by homomorphic encryption, for example, uh, at, at this level as well. Um, obviously, not every tensor will implement every operation um, that might differ between um, uh, what uh, technique we use. So underneath the uh, MPC tensor, we have um, two kinds of sharing. So we have an arithmetic shared tensor, and we also have an XOR or a binary shared tensor, and we can um, go back and forth between the two, uh, two, two of these tensors. Um, so what, we ha what I have said so far is only about interfaces and, um, and APIs. There has to be a tensor which actually stores the data. Um, and, and that is done by this thing called a long tensor. A long tensor is basically a tensor with in 64 type. And this is where we kind of cross over from Krypton land into um, PyTorch land. And this was a, and PyTorch, as I said, is a, is a leading machine learning framework uh, now in, in the neural network um, deep learning space. Um, and this decision we took um, very, very uh, deliberately. Um, there are a couple of things happen when you um, have this hard um, link to an existing machine learning framework. One of the things that happens um, is the interface filters up. So whatever functionality and the API the long tensor has, um, it filters up the API all the way up to the uh, grip tensor. You may or may not choose to implement um, all of these APIs, but it does, uh, does filter up and that gives a very natural um, interface to the uh, people in the machine learning community. The other thing that happens is uh, performance gets linked uh, in the sense when uh, things in PyTorch gets fast, Krypton gets fast, and that's also a very um, deliberate choice. And the other thing also happens, for example, nobody had, um, well, there re really wasn't no long tensor in PyTorch before Krypton showed up. Um, so Krypton also in inter uh, influences PyTorch design. So there's a nice give and take going on between um, these two frameworks. And the third one, maybe a little bit non-obvious, um, is, is the communication library. So machine learning is a very distributed operation. Um, currently, we can train models on you know, thousands of processors, so there's a communication library that does this. Um, it turns out that a lot of the communications that we, communication patterns that we see in multi-party compute uh, map very well to the communication libraries that we um, use for um, and distributed machine learning. So this was, um, a very lucky find in, in, in some sense. Um, what this design choice also um, leads to is it kind of decouples where protocol-specific optimizations need to happen and where non-protocol-specific optimizations need to happen. So anything in the, in the protocol-specific stuff can happen in the Krypton layer above the dotted line, and then anything um, to do that is not to do with the protocol, for example, making the communication libraries fast or making some math operations fast can happen um, completely in the um, PyTorch layer. So this, this makes life um, a, lot e a lot easier because then we can make minimal code changes to Krypton or PyTorch depending on what we are doing. So now that we have um, see seen tensors, let's look at what operations does uh, machine learning uh, training needs. Um, and this is a, uh, obviously a restricted set of operations than what you would do in a general purpose program. Um, but there are um, quite a few challenges. So I'll go from the simplest to the um, hardest. So the simplest from the view of secure MPC. Um, so the, fir the two um, simplest ones are matrix multiply or a dense matrix multiply, which is a, it's essentially is the component behind a fully connected layer. A fully connected layer is essentially a matrix multiply followed by adding a vector called a bias. Um, and this is easy to do because it's all additions and multiplies. Additions come for free. In additive sharing, uh, multiplies come with uh, Bevo triples. Um, and convolution, uh, the way it's done in machine learning, is usually done using matrix multiply because the spatial extent of this convolution filters is um, very, very small. So if you can do matrix multiply fast, we can do convolutions fast as well. Um, and the Beaver triple formula doesn't, uh, not only holds for scalars, it holds for tensors as well. So you can do it with tensors. Um, the next um, up is logs and exponentials. So logs, we, um, th these are all done through various series approximations. So logs we do through householder iteration. Exponential, we do a variant of repeated squaring. Um, we do division using Newton-Raphson. 
Um, then we do power, um, uh, power and square root using um, essentially exponential for power and, and log for um, square root. And then finally, we have operations that are very hard to polynomially uh, approximate. Um, so we have ReLU, which is, um, is it's a weird sounding function, but all it does is if a, if a value is negative, it sets it to zero. And if a value is positive, it just lets the value through. So you can think of it as an if condition, basically. Um, it's, people have tried doing polynomial approximations of this, but it never actually works. So these are the last, the last line of ReLU and max and argmax are done using circuits. And this is where we have to go from arithmetic sharing to um, binary sharing and back. Um, and max is usually uh, used in layers called, there's a max pooling layer, which essentially looks at a, a filter and finds the maximum value within the, built within the filter. Um, and argmax is also used in the um, same layer. So now that we have seen both the tensors and the operators, um, we need something um, above prip 10 to make um, things work. And the stuff that we need, need above prip 10 is to um, essentially some, some metadata and data to uh, accumulate gradients. So we have a separate tensor, which is called an autograd crypt tensor, which is used in the backward graph. So we now we have these tensors separate, but it's quite likely we are gonna fuse these tensors um, into one tensor, which, would, which we can use for both the forward and the backward graph. And we need one more um, object called a module. Um, module is essentially a kind of a convenience object. So in the, in the computation graph, you saw these operators as nodes. So it turns out that it's good to have some state along with these operators, and it's good to have a consistent interface for this operator, so there's a forward function and a backward function. So what the module does is takes all these operators and adds um, this kind of a standard API so that this graph can be traversed um, very easily. A module can also uh, contain other modules, so you can take a, a subgraph um, and express it as a module. So there are some layers of the neural network that are better expressed as um, um, subgraphs. So, uh, so that's where the module comes in handy as well. What this module allows us to do is to essentially use what I said, um, Onyx, so it um, gives us compatibility to uh, neural uh, other models that have been written out um, using PyTorch or TensorFlow or any other framework, and, and then we can read it through Onyx as a sequence of modules, essentially. Um, what this allows us to do is, um, if you have pre-trained models um, that have been trained non-encrypted, but you wanna do inference on encrypted data, uh, you can use those pre-trained models. You don't have to retrain anything. Um, if you have models um, that have specified in, in a PyTorch-like fashion, you can use Onyx to read this non-trained model, and you can train it from scratch also um, using Krypton. So you've kind of seen all of the components that, uh, major components that Krypton has. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on, on um, communication as well in the next slide. Um, this term might not mean anything to most people here. So all reduce um, is a communication pattern where you have a bunch of parties or peers who have a value uh, and they need to uh, exchange these values with each other, sum all their values, um, and then broadcast it back uh, to everybody. So this is essentially open to all in, in uh, MPC speak. Um, and already, so on, on everything that I'm shown on the left is something that already exists for distributed machine learning. Distributed machine learning uh, need the, needs this communication um, operators as well. Uh, the next part is reduce, which is the same thing where you don't do the broadcast back. So you uh, send data to one party, that party uh, sums up all the data and, and uh, you reduce to that party. And that's open to one. Um, you can also do a broadcast. You can, one party can send different values to different parties, so this you can think of as uh, communicating from trusted dealer um, to multiple parties. So these communication patterns already exist for doing distributed machine learning. Um, I also realize that um, this is constrained because um, this is fine when you have n out of n shares, n parties and n shares. It, it won't work for any kind of threshold scheme. Um, but it turns out that Another form of distributed machine learning, which is called model parallelism, um, needs more flexible communication libraries. And those uh, communication patterns used for model parallelism um, are also 
can be used for doing more um, flexible communication that are used needed in um, in, in threshold um, uh, sharing, for example. Um, so those are coming as well. Um, one thing I should also say is um, these communication patterns have been around in, in at least in computer science for a long time. Uh, they actually come from this very old um, communication library called MPI. I don't know if people have used MPI here, message passing interface. Um, it's used in, in scientific computing a whole lot because in scientific computing you have a bunch of um, com com compute going on in parallel and then you need to broadcast results uh, every once in a while. Um, so we found that quite interesting that it, it looks very much MPC-ish uh, from, from that perspective. So I wanted to give um, some examples of code. I've shown one example at the very beginning, but I wanted to show how similar code in Krypton looks like to code in PyTorch. So I'm, I'm gonna start with some code on the left in PyTorch, these are very small examples. Um, um, so this is something that takes two tensors and adds them. Um, and the code on the right is Krypton doing the same thing. Um, there is not a lot of difference. Uh, you import a new library and the, uh, everything has a crypt in front of it in some sense and then you do have some in it. Um, um, so this makes it very intuitive for somebody who had used um, not just PyTorch, even, even TensorFlow looks very similar to this. Um, if you want to do gradients, um, so here is some code um, on the left and right which, which does um, uh, gradients. So on the left we have a tensor, there's a, a cross entropy is what is called a loss function. Um, on the right we have the same variant of code in Krypton, it looks very similar. Um, and what we have done also is we have machinery in place to um, run Krypton completely in a browser. So a Jupyter Notebook is a very um, common tool in the space. Um, so we can load up, for example, Krypton in a Jupyter Notebook um, to kind of get started very easily. And this has proved very, very beneficial for people who are starting on this, um, um, starting, starting to kind of play around with this. Um, and in fact, all our examples um, in our source code is actually, they have examples in Jupyter as well, so people can, take, can get a taste. Um, I also wanted to show you what loading a real model and a real data set looks like. Um, and this is a very small inference example with uh, ImageNet, which is a very popular data set in computer vision, for example. Um, so on the right, I'm gonna show you code. So what I'm doing is here is importing some library, um, initializing Krypton, then there is, uh, I'm initializing an image transform which crops the image, for example. Uh, I load the data set, which is um, which loading it from a folder, image net folder. Um, this is a data set about you know, 1.7 million images or so. Um, and then I load a pre-trained model. A ResNet 18 is a full-scale model. Um, it's not, not a toy model. Um, and then we uh, encrypt the model, um, we encrypt the image, uh, we get an encrypted output, um, and you can reveal the encrypted output and you're gonna get the same result as you would have done the, everything in, in plain text. Um, so it doesn't look all that different from what you would do if you were um, not encrypting things. So this is what we have now. So where do we um, go from here? And by we, um, I mean not just people at Facebook, I would, we would love to have participation from both people here and in the machine learning community as well, um, because this is a, a long road. Um, so the first thing on our mind is improving performance. Um, we work in, as I said, an in 64 space. Uh, there's very little optimized libraries in in 64 space. Um, so we are writing um, some of like a more optimized version of in 64 matrix multiply, in 64 uh, convolutions. Facebook has a library called FBGEM for uh, matrix multiply, so we are writing vectorized code, usually using uh, AVX 512 um, uh, for uh, faster uh, matrix multiplies. And we aren't done yet, so we have done some initial implementation. We have to do more here. Um, on the hardware side, my wish list would be um, support for wider data types. Uh, 128 would be fantastic. Wider um, vector um, SIMD lengths would also be fantastic in this space. Um, the next one um, that we are working on is um, a trusted third party. So our current trusted third party is a trusted dealer, which um, 
I think is fine as a first cut, but we want to uh, explore other options of doing, of generating Beaver triples. Um, one idea may be using something like an Intel SGX or other form of peak encryption um, uh, schemes in the space. Um, though I sometimes wonder why we don't have a service for generating Beaver triples that will make our life a whole lot easier. Um, these are some of the near-term things that we're working on. Um, going forward, longer term would be support for other secure computing techniques, as I alluded to, um, um, should we have homomorphic encryption-based tensors? Should we have uh, some sort of enclave-based tensors? We don't have the right answer, and we don't know where, uh, what people would like to use, so in some sense, we are looking for feedback as well. Um, and also, um, other research-like things, for example, uh, privacy and security are, are not the same thing in many ways. Um, uh, you can do secure computing, but at some point, you have to open the result to actually take an action, so uh, you want, you know, maybe your model and data is encrypted, but at the end of the day, uh, you want to know what the, the cl what the classifier told you. And that might leak information about the model and the data. So how can you quantify how much information you're leaking? Um, and this goes to like maybe marrying things like uh, differential privacy techniques when we open uh, from a secure uh, computing domain and uh, how much noise to add um, is, is one um, research direction that we want to uh, pursue. But um, one thing that we want to keep in mind is um, no matter what we do as a, as a community in this space, uh, we should work in models and data sets that are actually practical. Um, there's a lot of research that works in the space using, say, MNIST, which is a very small data set, or CIFAR-10, which is also a very small data set. Um, these are not very useful. They're useful in, some, in proof of concept, but it's very hard to take something that works in just say MNIST and CIFAR and then extrapolate it to something that is really practical today. So with, with that in mind, um, I want to set forth the challenge of some sort for everybody here and also in machine learning in some sense, but um, a little bit of history. Um, so machine learning has had this challenge called the ILS VRC challenge. I think it has run since 2010, I believe. Um, I don't think it runs anymore. So what this challenge um, uh, set about was it first it created a large data set um, of a million images. Each image came with a tag of what object was there in the image. Um, and the idea was to train a model on the image and then classify with high, um, and, cla and, and on a test set, classify with very high accuracy. Um, so this is solved in some sense. We can do this with very, very high uh, accuracy. And not only that, we can train a model on a 1.7 million image data set in minutes. I think the fast in the record is two minutes, 43 seconds or so, but with some uh, degradation in, in uh, uh, accuracy, but uh, within 15 minutes we can train you know, very, very good um, models. Uh, and this has completely changed um, machine learning as we know it in the last five years. In some sense, the popularity of neural networks now is because neural networks were shown to be the best way of doing this. So in the same vein, I have a question. Um, so say we um, want to train on a million encrypted images, say from ImageNet, um, classify with high accuracy. We can cut ourselves some slack. Obviously, we are working in an encrypted domain. We are not going to get everything we want. So maybe we want an accuracy of, say, a relative 20% of what we can do now in clear text. Um, and then instead of being done in a minute, say we give ourselves a week. Um, I don't think anybody has done it, to my knowledge. Um, but if we can do it, um, I think this will be a step function change in, 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 in the community. Um, it'll be the same step function change as how uh, neural networks were first able to do the ILS VRC challenge, I believe, in 20, 2012. Um, with, I, I, I forget the number, but it was a, a massive increase in accuracy. It'll be that, that kind of a change. So. Um, with that, I wanted to introduce you to the Krypton team at Facebook. We are a very, very small team. Um, alphabetically, we are Aoni, Brian, Lawrence, Mark, Shoba, myself, Vinny, and Shane.
uh, where we are very open to collaboration. We are a research group, so and everything we do is an open source. So we we'll love for uh, love for people here to be interested in what we do and collaborate with us. Thank you. So in the examples that you showed, um, I didn't understand that you can actually specify a multi-party uh, machine learning situation. Like, if you want to train a model using data from multiple parties, how do you declare the parties? Yeah, so I, what I didn't show you is the, the tensor constructor that you saw has a source argument, so I'm basically showing one party here. So you can have one party have the data and another party have the model, and you specify the sources. So uh, MPI has this notion of a rank. So you can say if rank equals zero, which is the first party, then you have the data. If rank equals one, you have the model. And, you, and we can do multi-party compute in any number of parties. Yeah. So we have it in the examples, but for convenience, I didn't show it here. Thanks. Um, hi. Thanks for a nice talk. So when you spoke about the performance coupling between sort of PyTorch in the lower layer and then the Krypton at the upper layer, you spoke about it very positively. But it can also have a negative side to it, because I assume that developers of PyTorch are interested in optimizing PyTorch for the regular case. And that sometimes might make it slower for MPC. Like if they reduce the amount of operations greatly, but at the cost of increasing the amount of multiplication, say, right? That would be faster in a, in a regular execution sense, but an MPC will be slower. So do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point, And that, I think, battle will exist. Um, just the fact that I'm in. I, I know the PyTorch team very well, so I can, um, it's easy for us to influence, let's say, those, those decisions. And for example, being able to do you know, um, convolution in the N64 space, if you went to PyTorch team and said, I want to do convolutions in the N64 space, be like, you're crazy. Uh, but here we are. Um, but yeah, we are very cognizant of this, um, and we are trying to push to have more of these features in PyTorch. So other, the, entire, the community in PyTorch is huge. So the, so the motivation there is if we can do these changes in PyTorch core, then everybody benefits in some sense. But yeah, absolutely, that, that will exist always. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned that you have to do some transformations potentially to do like the max type of operator. Do you implement specializations for a particular number of parties, such as those no. in like APY3 or SecureNN? Okay. No. That was an explicit design goal, not to have party-specific optimizations. And I don't know how far we can go with that. At some point, we may have to have party-specific um, optimizations, but we wanted to have as any number of parties. And that was actually a problem for us. I think our first implementation, we were using two parties, and then we went, we went to three, and everything broke. Hello, Sahar Maslum from George Mason University. Thank you for a great talk. I really enjoyed it. So my question is about, uh, so the framework that you just described is another framework that how to do um, machine learning in secret computation. And uh, so as we saw yesterday, there are a couple of other like frameworks out there that does similar um, functionality, provide similar functionalities. Do you have a kind of like, a, do you have any idea of uh, how your functionality is compared to others in terms of, uh, because everything goes down to how you approximate those functions, like for example, log that you just mentioned, or a max pooling or some other functionalities. So do you know, have a, like a, do you have a benchmark in mind that how do you compare with others, how the approximations differs in terms of like the performance, uh, the leakage that you um, just touched based on, and uh, some other like features? Yeah, so our max is actually not approximate. Our max is done using a circuit, so it's exact max. Um, actually, we are doing this now for our own sake. Um, the approximations we, we do are valid in number ranges that we see in training. Um, so we want to do it. I should also say the frameworks that were discussed yesterday, they're much more general frameworks. You can write a code in, in that specific framework with particular annotations. Um, obviously, we are not doing that. We are, everything we do is very, very specific to uh, machine learning. And this is a decision that we took very, very consciously. Um, so our goal was to avoid compiling as much as possible, um, because what we have seen is 
languages take a long time to get traction in a community. Um, just going from Python 2 to Python 3 took 10 years, and that's just one language. <laughs> so we wanted to stick to an uh, interface that is familiar to community and start from there, but okay. yeah, we are, we are starting to look at um, comparing with how good our approximations are, how fast they are. Actually, our slowest operation is a division operator, which is kind of weird. The <laughs> newton raphson so the other thing with like using newton raphson is you cannot, in, secure, in, in a secure space, you cannot say, when did I converge? Because that reveals information. So we have like a fixed number of steps of newton raphson that we do. Um, and, and yeah, and that works for some number ranges, but we have to see what we can do for others. It's yeah, tricky. I feel what you say. <laughs> it's tricky. At that. <laughs> Thank you so much. So in, in your talk about the N64 for deep learning, your dynamic range, how, I mean, is there a decimal point floating over to the left somewhere? Because otherwise... It's fixed point right now, so which is represented as N64, essentially. So log is the lookup in a table of 64 numbers. Um, log is not a lookup. We actually do a series approximation for log. So log you can expand as a series, right? Right, but that's not, I mean, if you're taking a log and you're rounding it down to integer or an, an N64, it's the map, you, there's very few outputs. There are what? There are very few outputs. As in the uh, precision or? The, map, the biggest log you can have is 64. Yeah. And then the smallest log you can have is zero. Yeah. And so why do we need a newton raphson iteration for this? So you, you want, like, because the N64, we, basically it's a fixed point representation in N64. So it's a decimal point that is fixed. Oh, over, over, in, the, over in the left somewhere. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 exactly, right. yes. All right, let's thank Shu again. Next speaker, Flavio. Oh, there. This is one. There you go. I need the this one. Flavio from IBM Research. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this talk is towards a homomorphic machine learning big data pipeline for the financial services sector. So everybody's talking about machine learning today. And um, I'm glad a lot of people talked before me, so I can cut a lot of the, <laughs> the parts that I was going to say. Um, this um, talk is um, about a collaboration that we did with one of the banks, uh, with Banco Bradesco in Brazil. Uh, in the first and the second quarter of last year. I would like to thank my co-authors uh, in this work and also uh, my collaborators, uh, Shai and uh, Victor, uh, that were with us there. And uh, also the reviewers of this conference because since I couldn't review the name of the institution until today, it was kind of a a very dry abstract that I had to submit. But uh, hopefully I'm gonna be able to do some, present a lot more today. So uh, just to put things in context, um, Banco Bradesco in Brazil, um, Latin America, not everybody heard of it, but it's the second largest private bank in Brazil. Uh, it's in terms of a brand, it's the most valuable brand in the country, and this is important because if you consider data leaks, data exfiltration, and all sorts of things that can happen that damage your brand. So security is paramount for them. 
Uh, the number of clients, individual current account holders, is 72 million. Uh, they do 70,000 tasks. This is not only the transaction, this is the task that involved the transaction, the commits on the database, and everything else that happens on the back end per second. And uh, you're going to say, well, why they are looking at homomorphic something to protect the data is because they are, uh, they embrace advanced technology very early. So they want to be ready for when technology is available. So what was the challenge that uh, they came to us is um, sharing data amongst the different business units. It's an interesting thing because there are, in, particularly in regulated industries like financial services, uh, because there are not only privacy laws, but uh, antitrust and a lot of other things that don't allow people to see data from different uh, departments of your own company altogether, right? Um, so they can be breaking some regulation somehow. The order is this year, the equivalent of GDPR it starts to be enforced in Brazil. So they wanted to be prepared to how they're going to move this forward, uh, which then led to, at the end of 2017, beginning of, uh, and uh, discussions in 2018, for them to start looking at what sort of technologies could be applied to keep the data encrypted all the time. So they approached us because of home of encryption. And uh, the other important challenge is how do we do this in a hybrid cloud environment, right? And there is a lot in there. Um, so when you do this sort of work, what are the people that you're going to get together, right? So just to give an example of the kind of the breadth that we had to discuss there, uh, we had the, our sponsors in their team, which, are, which were their R&D team, and the CTO. But then you need the systems inf and infrastructure people involved, because you need to understand what the impact of this new technology is going to cause on everything else that people have there. You need the data governance people, because you need to show that what you are doing is secure to some extent. Uh, the security people are going to say, well, the, what the security people are doing there? Well, homomorphic encryption and some of the advanced crypto stuff that we talk here is not mainstream yet. And these people don't understand necessarily what it is. So there was a whole education process to show them what security can be achieved with it. And... Uh, the important people, the data analysts, because they are the ones that are going to consume whatever we did. And obviously, um, our team, with very frequent technical meetings and exchange along the process. So just to put things in context, homomorphic encryption allows us to process data without giving access to it. Technically achieved by computing unencrypted data without ever decrypting the data, which basically means that it's not encrypted in the registers or anything of the machine. It addresses that problem that I mentioned before, which is how I can share data when data can only be shared on a need-to-know basis and there are regulations and so on. So we, how can we address that aspect? And uh, it's important to consider what threat model we are addressing here for this scenario. It's the honest but curious, which basically means that the entity performing your computation is a legitimate entity to perform that computation, but it wants to learn from what you're doing. And FHE is based on lattice cryptography, therefore um, quantum resistant to the best of our knowledge today. So 
let's have a look at the problem. Uh, banks and financial institutions use uh, machine learning, something what people call traditional machine learning, which is basically regression-based machine learning, for a variety of things. And you're going to say, well, why not to the fancy neural network stuff? Because they are regulated industries. It needs to be, you need to be able to explain easily why a given prediction was done in a given way. So if you have many hidden layers there and you can't say why a decision was taken, that can be tricky. So banks use this a lot for certain tasks like marketing, loans approval, and so on. So the data set that we used um, were, comprises real financial data over a window, is a sliding window of 24 months of uh, measurements that they make about every one of us. Uh, so basically the bank measured me in 546 individual explanatory features, uh, which is a mix of um, quantitative, categorical, and uh, binary features. Uh, and the other important thing is the amplitude of the values. Take, take just one thing. Let's say your current balance. Your current balance might be minus a few hundred dollars or plus a few million dollars, right? So when you're trying to do machine learning, this type of thing, so things get tricky because of how you do, um, how you manipulate the precision you want to do. So this is what they do, right? And uh, with that group that we put together, we had to figure out um, what the use case and what we're going to do. So we looked at, OK, so let's put a fully homomorphic encryption um, transaction data store and see if we can do predictions, if we can do um, machine learning with that. So we took the marketing scenario. The marketing scenario that they work with is one that can they predict whether someone who is going to need a loan within the next three months. This is, in, this is an important task they do because they can upsell loans. Uh, but look at the second bullet there. It's a rare event in that data set. It's around 1% which basically means that if I didn't do any machine learning, just said no, I'm going to be right 99% of the time. But the golden nugget is in that 1%. If you can find that 1% in your transactions, that's where you make money. So that's why the importance for this. And the data is very sparse. So what was the success criteria for us to do prediction uh, homomorphically. The first one was, if I have an existing model and existing data, can I encrypt the model and the data, run the predictions with the same accuracy as the predictions done without encryption? Right? And this is an important aspect because you don't go to a bank and say, well, you know, this 10 years of modeling that you have, throw it all away because we're going to start a law again. No, so you have to be able to do that with what they have. The second is to perform a task in machine learning, which is very important and quite often overlooked, which is um, variable selection, right? So remember, I said 546 explanatory features, but the models will have tens of features, because although we have a lot of features, many of those features are highly correlated. So you have to get rid of those features and find the ones that are the most relevant for the condition that you try to, to predict. And the question is, can we do this variable selection homomorphically with the same accuracy that's done without encryption? And uh, so those were the two main uh, success criteria. And obviously, with some acceptable overhead, because if you're doing everything, 
as we saw from the last talk, uh, things can happen in seconds or a week or so. So how do they do it today? And this is an important aspect. Is everything is done on premise because this data is private, it's confidential, it's sensitive, so they don't put this information in the cloud. And to prevent exfiltration of data, uh, the environment where the data analysts work is a secure environment. So you can't take your cell phone, that sort of stuff, in there, right? So, and you can't take your laptop and come back with the data either. So the data and the machines stay where you are, which is very costly for organizations to do it that way. And some of the organizations, because of the regulations, the data has to be physically separated, and you can't use, you can't even use uh, multi-tenant environment systems, right? So you can see that the cost of infrastructure, if you have to do this in-house, is very high. So we came along and said, okay, let's do this in the cloud, right? So if we own the premises, which is secure, we take our transactions, we encrypt our transactions, and we send them encrypted to somewhere in the cloud where we can do um, predictions if I've already got a model, or I can run some machine learning to derive new models. I have encrypted predictions, so the cloud cannot see anything. It's honest environment, but curious. Uh, and I bring back the results, and then I can decrypt. So that was the premise that we did. So we, and we did that, right? Um, our paper shows the, all the maths and how we organize the data, how we encode the data, how we try to optimize everything for a SIMD-like uh, um, computation. But what I want to show you is um, more of the, the results that we got. So our experimental platform, a mainframe. And you're gonna say, well, mainframe, why a mainframe, right? So why can't you do this elsewhere? Uh, because most of the transaction data is on the mainframe, out of the financial institutions. Uh, they are also currently evaluating how they use the mainframe in an, as integral part of a hybrid cloud strategy. So you have the elastic environments that you can consume in the cloud and how this can work there. Um, our library, HLA, runs in the cloud, or sorry, runs both in the cloud and on the mainframe. And, uh, it's open source. So these were some of the characteristics that were appealing to them to, to, to come to us uh, and talk, and the requirement of the mainframe. So results, how does this look like? Prediction. Uh, we took a, an existing model. This is a 16 variables existing model. Uh, we took the data, we encrypted data, we encrypted the model, we run through an encrypted uh, logistic regression-based uh, prediction model, and uh, the accuracy was pretty good, right? Because we are using here an approximate number a scheme for homomorphic encryption, and the accuracy was very good. So that part number one. So when we proved that we could do predictions with the same accuracy, the next step was, well, can we do variable selection? Can we do the training? Can we retrain that model with new data, but now encrypted? And uh, we did this too. So what we are showing here is um, the log loss of the variable selection based on how many steps we do in the training versus um, the sigmoid approximation that we used, right? So that was mentioned before because you cannot 
is stop your, you cannot check how good you are, and you cannot stop your computation, you have just to. So we did that, and we showed that for um, five and six steps with um, sigmoid, uh, uh, sigmoid approximation of third degree or seven degree, uh, was pretty much the same when compared to this yellow curve is doing it in the clear without encryption. Uh, the next question you're going to ask me is, well, how long does it take? Uh, so this is the computation overhead. Computation overhead in terms of, uh, uh, depending on the security level, for 256-bit security was 50 times. And you're going to say, oh, dear, it takes 50 times longer to compute. No, this is pretty good when you're talking homomorphic <laughs> encryption. Right? Uh, in 2018, would be a few hundred times. Um, the memory overhead for the prediction uh, wasn't bad either. It's about 20 times for 256-bit security. So once we have this, how do we put this together, right? Remember this? What's wrong with this chart? The wrong with, what's wrong with this chart is that this is the kind of a more research academic way of looking at it, where I have machine learning thing and I have encryption and so on, but I'm missing this part, which is how do I deploy? How do I generate my keys? How do I store my keys? How I manage my keys? How I make sure? that the whole th system works and there is the coordination that I require, right? Which basically means that I still need the secure environment because on that side, I have data in the clear become encrypted to be deployed in an unsecure environment. I can, I have to retrieve my keys from my key store and remember, these are homomorphic keys. They are very, very large compared to everything else that we have been using so far. And when I decrypt, when I decrypt, I need my secret key to decrypt. So again, I need a trusted environment, otherwise I can leak my secret key and then everything gone away. Right, so this is, this is the environment that we have been working recently and how we integrate uh, everything in a framework that can actually be consumed for whether you do machine learning, whether you do searches or some of the others, okay? And I have one minute for questions. <laughs> Uh, do you see homomorphic encryption as a way of reducing uh, consumers' exposure to, like, uh, maybe data leaks and stuff? Well, data leaks are still going to happen, but if, it's, if it happens in an encrypted form with a strong encryption, then uh, there is no damage on the data being leaked. A lot of the data has already been leaked just by going on the Internet. Uh, and it has been captured in an encrypted form, but people are trying to, to decrypt it. So if we get quantum computer somewhere, or someday that could be vulnerable. With lattice-based encryption, then uh, it's less so, less so. Last question. Yeah, um, I would be curious to know, you know, uh, you know, based on your experience and all the work that you guys have done, um, how far away do you think we are from uh, you know, fully homomorphic encryption to be at a point where it is sort of feasible for most of us to be able to use it, sort of in a commercial setting or, uh, you know, a lot more than what we are able to do now, which is not much because of the performance costs associated with it. Well, actually, for it's very use case dependent, and uh, we tend to say that right now we are at that inflection point where the performance is adequate for certain use cases. 
most of what I show you runs out of the batch system. The predictions, they are not sub-second predictions. They, they are, it's an overnight task. So if it takes an hour or 10 hours to run, but with security, and I can outsource that to the cloud instead of having to, to do everything in-house, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Great. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Breaks now. <laughs>